remote sensing is very important for climate change because before remote sensing came in a big way through satellites, uh, we knew only about climate change in land regions. We did not have much data over oceans, except where ships went. Today, we have a global view of temperature change, rainfall change, uh, change in glaciers, change in Arctic sea ice. So remote sensing has played a very important role for us to understand what changes are occurring in the world. Okay, so this is a very important topic for you. Now let us define the topic. Remote sensing is a technique for obtaining information about objects through analysis of data collected by special instruments that are not in physical contact with the objects. Okay, that's the key. The word remote means you're not in touch, okay? I'll give an example. All of you know how you take your body temperature. You put a thermometer in your mouth and take the temperature. But today, all of you know that if you go anywhere, they put a little uh, beam of light in your hand to measure the temperature. That is remote sensing. Uh, that is not accurate. As a matter of fact, how many of you know, measuring temperature by just uh, measuring the uh, emission from your hand is not accurate because all of us, when we have under normal condition, the body temperature, core body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade. But your skin temperature can be anywhere between 33, 34, 35, depending upon your skin conductivity and how your blood flow is. So there's lots of variation, okay? So when you shake somebody's hand, you'll see some people's hands are very warm, some are cold. So uh, measuring temperature of a human being through remote sensing is not very accurate, but it is very convenient uh, when you want to measure uh, temperature of a lot of people, okay? Remember that remote sensing is an indirect method, so there will be errors. And the main purpose in this lecture is to uh, let you understand uh, the fact that although lots of data are available to download, you have to carefully examine whether the data is accurate, whether the data is good enough for your application, okay? Now, remote sensing comes in various forms. It can be through aircraft, uh, can be through balloons, can be through satellites. Uh, <clears throat> so we will focus mainly on satellites because that is the most important source of all the data that we're getting today about our Earth. Now here's an example of what comes from remote sensing. Remember that before the advent of satellites, people did not know about a cyclone until it hit the coast of a city, okay? So in the 19th and first half of the 20th century, many coastal cities were complete because the cyclone came without any warning, okay? So today that's not uh, happening. Today we know at least one week in advance when a cyclone appears in the Bay of Bengal. And uh, so here is an example of three cyclones together. Uh, I think this is uh, in the Caribbean, if I remember correctly. Now why is uh, satellite remote sensing so convenient? It has a synoptic view. It gives you a big view, the big picture of what is happening and they cover a wide area, which, uh, which are not easily accessible like polar regions and uh, faraway oceans, okay? But the problem is the parameters measured by satellites are not directly related to what we want. For example, I want sea surface temperature. I want ice cover. I want the snow moment. These are not uh, directly uh, obtained by satellite. The satellite gets only radiation from the Earth atmosphere system, okay? You have to somehow convert this radiation to a physically relevant quantity, okay? So that is one, for example, here is, there is mention of clouds. If there are clouds, then you cannot measure the sea surface temperature easily, okay? You can do it with a certain frequency range, but you can measure that in the infrared because clouds are almost opaque to the infrared radiation. Okay, so you have to remember that in trying to obtain a physical quantity from satellite data, one has to know the laws of radiation and know how to invert this data to get what we want. And in doing so, you will make some assumption. 
and we have to know what the assumptions are. And because of the assumption, there is some inaccuracy in your uh, data you get. So this is what I want you to remember, that when you get a data from any source like satellite, carefully look at what is the accuracy of the data <coughs> by various uh, ways, okay? Now, satellites have become a very powerful tool for data assimilation. That is, our uh, forecast, weather forecast models, as well as climate models, uh, assimilate data from satellites. And you can see in the period 1996 to 2010, uh, the amount of satellite data that is assimilated in a 24-hour period uh, has gone up to 30 million data points, okay? That is uh, at 2010. At, by 2020, that number went to 60 million. So 60 million pieces of data are going in to the uh, weather forecast model. And that is why the weather forecast that being made today is very accurate to at least four or five days. Because the model has been told where the clouds are, where the, where the ice is, where the uh, sea surface temperature is. And because of that, it's able to correctly predict how the weather will change for a few days. Uh, but after a few days, the errors in the climate model start accumulating, and the model tends to predict a wrong uh, weather or climate. So uh, that's why weather forecast models, usually you can't trust them beyond four or five days, okay? After four or five days, they're very accurate. Uh, you can watch today, you can download the data from many websites, including IMD, and you can watch how they predict rainfall and temperature. You will find that temperature is quite accurate for even 10 days, 15 days, but not rainfall. Rainfall is tough to measure and tough to predict. So again, reminding you, satellites don't measure temperature, uh, moisture, or uh, ozone or wind. They measure only radiation. And we need to convert this radiation into a geophysical information. This is called the inverse problem. Now, one of the important things to know that this inversion problem will not give a unique solution because you are measuring the total amount of radiation coming out of the atmosphere and from, let's say, land, okay? And suppose I want the land surface temperature. I have to remove the effect of the atmosphere and then look at how much land is emitting, okay? So, you're getting, let's say, 300 watts a meter squared as the radiation that's measured by satellite. It may be 100 watts from uh, atmosphere and 20, uh, 200 watts from, from land, but it could also be 200 from atmosphere, 100 from land, both give you 300. So, there is a lack of uniqueness in the solution. So, this equation that I'll talk about has more than one solution. So you have to be very careful in how you do the inversion and how you make sure that you get the correct solution because there's more than one solution and you can get the wrong one, okay? Now here is a picture of a satellite uh, showing the various parts. Uh, the, uh, it has to have, of course, power source. That's why you have a solar panel. Then you need, a, uh, let me just get the pointer going here. Yeah. You need a sensor, which I'll talk about, various sensors, which look down into the uh, earth and measure the radiation. Of course, after the sensor measures it and converts it into a electrical signal, it has to go to a antenna to communicate to the ground. So you need a communication antenna. <clears throat> and all these instruments in the satellite are accommodated in what is called the bus. Bus is the structure of the satellite in which the solar panel, the, the sensors, the communication channel, all are fitted together, okay? Now, you must remember that this is a very challenging problem in satellite uh, technology because there's only so much space available in a satellite. So you have to accommodate all the instruments in that space, and you cannot make the instruments too heavy because then you look at a bigger rocket to launch it. And the power consumption by the electronics in the satellite cannot be too high because if it's very high, then you need more solar panels. So these are tough challenges. And in the design of each satellite, these challenges have to be met. That is what I call volume constraint, weight constraint, 
and power constraint. There are three constraints. You cannot have too much volume because there's not enough space there. You cannot have too much weight because that means uh, you need a bigger satellite. And you cannot consume too much power because you may not have sufficient power coming out of the solar panel. So all these challenges are have to be met, and that's why it takes about 10 years to design a satellite for an application. Now, satellite measures essentially radiation. And radiation, of course, all of you know, is in the entire uh, range of uh, wavelength from ultraviolet to visible to near IR, the solar region, then thermal IR, which is emission by Earth, then uh, far infrared, again, emission by Earth, microwave, also emitted by Earth, and of course, radio waves. Now, we need to use all these wavelengths for our uh, application. Now, the ultraviolet and visible near air are very useful because they come from the sun. Sun's radiation is reflected by the Earth, and you can measure it. And, uh, and the sun, sun is a powerful radiation source, so we get a lot of good signal here. But if you want to measure the temperature of the Earth, then you have to go to thermal and far IR. Uh, ranges. You know that Earth emits the uh, highest radiation around 10 micron. So you have to be around 10 micron in order to uh, sense the temperature of Earth. But you also tend to go to microwave where the emission is very low. Uh, we go there only because in the microwave, the atmosphere is more transparent. Okay, The transparency is very, very important if you want to measure properties at the Earth's surface. Suppose you want to see a glacier you want to see snow cover, then you need the atmosphere to be transparent, okay? So that's why you, a lot of uh, thing to measure ice and snow is in the microwave, because during the monsoon season, you cannot uh, find out how much uh, area is covered in snow or glacier, because clouds will cover it. So if you go to microwave, the clouds are transparent, so you can look through it. That's clear? Okay, the same graph is shown uh, in the X plane, uh, showing the peak of the uh, Earth radiation, peak of sun radiation, and all the frequencies in terms of uh, hertz, in terms of wavelength, and this is just for your information. Okay, now let me stop here and ask whether anybody has any questions. Uh, Arya, can you see if there are any questions in the uh, chat box? Uh, as if now, no, sir, no questions. Oh, good. So, but if you, if you have it, please stop me because uh, I'm sure you need a break. So if you have any uh, too much information uh, coming at you, you want a quick uh, recap or something, you can ask even now, okay? So I'll wait a few uh, seconds to see any chat box questions are appearing. Okay, if so nothing, I will continue and again ask a little later. Now, there are three ways of sensing the Earth atmosphere. Okay, The most popular is passive. Passive means I don't use any uh, radiant source of my own. I just depend upon whatever the Earth emits or reflects. Okay, So I, I pick up the radiation emitted by the atmosphere or the Earth, or I pick up the radiation reflected by the Earth atmosphere. This is the most popular because it is the least expensive. But remember that the signal is not very strong. So you need sensors which amplify the signal sufficiently for you to uh, able to uh, retrieve the parameter you want. Okay? That's why some people uh, like active technology. In active te technology, the satellite sends out the radiation like a laser okay? uh, to the atmosphere and looks at the reflection scattered back. Okay? It can be radar, that is in the radio waves, or it can be in the visible. Okay? So these are very interesting methods because you have total control over what frequency of radiation you send and what is the power of the radiation sent. So you can choose that, okay? So these are more powerful, but remember that if you put an active instrument in a satellite, you need a lot of power because you want to send a laser beam, the laser consumes a lot of power, all of you know that. Same thing for radar. So the main challenge for an active instrument is it is heavy, it consumes a lot of power, and uh, it can fail. For example, a uh, few years ago, a very important uh, uh, satellite was launched called AOLUS, A-E-L-O-U-S, about which I'll mention something in the end. 
uh, that satellite failed after one year because of laser failed to work. The laser is a very complex instrument, it can fail. In the case of passive instrument, there is no problem there uh, because radiation is coming from the earth as emission reflection and your sensor is usually simple sensor which does not fail easily. The last technology is a new one called the GPS technology is a global system. Now the reason why I mention it that the passive and active technology depend upon the radiation emitted, reflected and absorbed by the earth atmosphere system. GPS then depends. GPS mainly depends on how the radio waves sent by the GPS uh, emitter bends as it goes through the earth. So it is based only on the change in refractive index. So it is a very powerful technique and uh, does not require any calibration because it doesn't depend on absorption emission, it depends only on how the ray bends, okay? So I will not spend too much time on it, but if anybody interested, you can ask question at the end. Now in passive technologies, uh, <coughs> we uh, can look at emission, that's the most popular, uh, and this is used to measure temperature profile in atmosphere, humidity profile, ozone profiles, or surface temperature, okay, in non-cloudy areas, remember that. But you can also measure surface temperature in cloudy areas, you go to microwave. If you might go to microwave, you can measure temperature and humidity, both in clear and cloudy areas, but not in rainy areas. When it rains heavily, even microwave will have problem. Okay, all of you know that your mobile phone doesn't work too well if it's raining heavily. So heavy rain, of course, obstructs all signal, okay? And here are examples of various uh, uh, satellites launched by NASA, but I'll come to each one of them a little later. Now let's come to active instrument. They send radiation to a target and measure what is reflected or scattered, okay? So this is used to measure surface winds. Uh, because when wind is blowing on the ocean, the ocean becomes rough. When it becomes rough, it scatters radiation in a different way than when it is not rough. So that is exploited to measure wind speed. You can also measure surface height uh, by sending a signal and seeing how long it takes to, uh, when it comes back. You can measure rain, uh, cloud and aerosol profile because you can look at the scattering by rain and cloud and aerosol and use that to measure these quantities using radars and lidars. LIDAR, LIDAR is laser uh, uh, based uh, detection and ranging. Okay. So uh, then we have wind profilers which measure the profile of the wind uh, using Doppler shift. I'll mention that briefly. And of course, you can also measure moisture profiles. And, and the satellites which carry active sensors I mentioned here, uh, TRIM is NASA, ERS is European, uh, Sea Wind is uh, NASA, QuickSat is uh, NASA, ADOS, I believe, is uh, Japanese, and so on. And NVSAT is European. Okay, now let's come to the principle of remote sensing. Uh, basic principle is, the satellite is measuring radiation emitted by the surface, which goes to the atmosphere, or emission by various layers of the Earth's atmosphere, which goes to space. And this, all the radiation from various levels and the surface can be written down in terms of an uh, equation, where I lambda is the intensity arriving at the satellite, and tau is the optical depth, and I lambda tau star is the emission from the surface, and next term is the attenuation through the atmosphere, this is the surface term, and the integral shows emission by all the layers from the surface to the top of the atmosphere, uh, emission, and then it's attenuation, okay? So this is the full equation, an integral equation, which has to be solved for finding some different example. Suppose you want to know the temperature of the layer, small t is the temperature here. So uh, you have to know the other quantities, attenuation quantities, and you have to know the surface temperature. Then you can estimate this quantity if you measure this quantity on the left. 
Okay, you measure I lambda here and try to estimate B lambda T at a given level. And suppose you want to measure temperature at 10 different levels. You choose 10 different wavelengths, uh, which will uh, sense emission from various layers. So you have 10 equations in 10 unknowns, and you can use a computer uh, matrix inversion to get the temperature, say in a simple way, OK? And now whatever I said in the last slide is now written down here uh, in a different way. So intensity measure at the south side is equal to intensity uh, coming out of the surface times the attenuation through the atmosphere. Here, tau is the attenuation. And B of Z is emission by that layer. And D tau DZ is the change of the uh, transmission with uh, depth, OK, into DZ. And this quantity here is called the weighting function. Why? Because it tells you how much weightage is going to emission at this level Z. If this quantity is large, then more weightage is going to this level. If this quantity is small, then this level is not important. Is that clear to all of you? This is the most important principle in remote sensing. OK? Yeah. The best way to illustrate that is through the uh, radiation measured by satellite for various wavelengths. This is the blue dots here, OK? Now, if you look at the blue dots, and I'll show you the various levels from which radiation is coming. Now, at the top here, around the 15 micron band, where carbon dioxide absorbs very strongly, the emission coming to the satellite is from the level around 15 kilometers, not surface. Surface emission will not reach the satellite because of strong CO2 absorption. But if you go somewhere here, around here, I would say somewhere around 5 micron or so, or 7 micron, where there's not that much absorption, then you're going to look at the emission near the Earth's surface. So for various wavelengths, various layers of atmosphere play a role. So these arrows show you which part of the atmosphere is contributing most to that radiation at that level, okay? measured by satellite. So this is the principle of remote sensing. You use different wavelengths to get signal from different levels in the atmosphere. And that way, you can get the entire temperature profile of the atmosphere, OK? To make the point even more clear, I have given two examples. One wavelength uh, in the 15 micron band, carbon dioxide absorption band. Uh, because of a strong absorption, you will only get the emission from the higher layers of the atmosphere, around 10, uh, 10 millibar, OK? And uh, so this is mainly for measurement in the stratosphere. But if you want to know more about what is happening near the Earth's surface, you go to another channel where the emission is mainly from the surface layers. So this uh, x-axis here is called the weighting function. It tells you uh, where is the maximum signal coming from. If it shows the 15 micron channel, you will get the highest signal from around 10 millibar. If it shows 13.5 micron, just slightly outside the CO2 absorption band, you will get something around 500 millibar. Okay? And if you choose 10 micron, you will get almost the Earth's surface emission. So the weighting function depends on sensing in the, uh, the satellite. So one more example here, waiting function. Uh, 11 and 12 micron uh, channels are the window channels of the, of the atmosphere. Uh, absorbs very small. So the highest weighting is at the ground level. Okay. Now, if you go to the water vapor band, which is at 6.7, it is strongly absorbs radiation. So it will only give you radiation coming at around 7 kilometers. Okay. So if you choose a uh, region where the atmosphere is transparent, you will get wetting friction uh, uh, highest near the ground. If you chose the center of an absorption band like water vapor or carbon dioxide, you will get radiation from around 7 kilometers per water vapor and around 
20-25 kilometers for carbon dioxide. Now, in all the old uh, sounders, so the method of measuring the vertical profile of temperature or concentration will cause sounding. And the old uh, sounders had maybe 10, 50 channels. Today, we have modern sounders, which are typically 3,000 channels, 3,000, OK? And the, uh, there are, uh, it is sensing every 0.5 centimeter minus one of wave number. So a huge number of things are there. So you have actually got too much data. So here, you cannot just take your matrix inversion, because you have, let's say, 100 unknowns that you want to uh, know about temperature and concentration. And there are 3,000 channels. So here is where machine learning comes into play. Here, what you do is you look at the radiation emitted by all the wavelengths, there are 3,000 wavelengths there. And you use a radiation transfer model to calculate the radiation that we emitted at those wavelengths for a given temperature and moisture profile. And then you take the difference between radiation measured by satellite and radiation uh, obtained from the model, take the difference, square it, and add over all the channel and find the root mean square difference. Okay. If it is large, then again you change the profile shape and the values. Again, do it. You keep doing it until you get a minima. Okay. So this can be done if your computer is powerful. So today the uh, machine learning and AI is getting popular only because the computer is very powerful. They can look at 3,000 channels very easily. So today, this is the method in which by which you calculate the vertical profile of temperature or moisture or carbon dioxide or ozone uh, by using a large number of channels. And so because of their accuracy, goes up. I hope it's clear. Now let me stop again and see, are there any questions? Uh, Alia, can you check? Anybody has a yes. question? Yes, sir. There are two yes. questions. Sure. Uh, first is, uh, kindly explain the concept of transparency and atmospheric window. And atmospheric? Window. OK. So the, I'll show you that uh, it has not yet come, come a little later. So if you plot the transmission of the atmosphere with wavelength, there are only a few wavelengths where atmosphere is more or less transparent. One is visible. All of you know that because our eyes are sensitive to visible. Then there is a region between 10 to 12 micron where uh, we have a window. And then we have window in the microwave. Microwave atmosphere is very transparent. That's why microwave is used in mobile communication. Okay? So there are only three regions. Uh, and also the small region within 3 to 4 micron where uh, there's a window. So window is 0.4 to 0.7, 3 to 4, 10 to 12, and beyond 1,000 micron in the microwave. So these are the channels we need to use to measure surface quantities. On the other hand, if you want to measure clouds or rainfall, then you want to be in a region where that rainfall is emitting radiation or that uh, carbon dioxide, which you want to measure, emitting radiation. Okay. So the method used to measure surface quantities and atmospheric quantities are very different. To measure surface quantity, you need to be in the window channel. To measure atmospheric quantity, you need to be in a channel where there is emission and absorption. Okay. Now, what's the next question? Emission and absorption of radiation of an object is dependent on what? It depends on wavelength. It depends on direction. And depends also on these uh, material properties. Okay. So uh, metals be in one way, uh, water be in another way. So we'll give examples. So uh, this quantity, uh, we measure the uh, ability of a body to emit radiation in terms of an emissivity, how much the body emits at a given temperature compared to an ideal body called the black body, that ratio. Okay? And that ratio is always less than one because uh, Laws of thermodynamics tell you that this ideal body emits maximum radiation. Nobody can be that body. So all real surfaces emit less than the ideal body. 
So emissivity is always less than or equal to one. But emissivity is a strong function of wavelength and angle. The same surface, when you look vertically down, it may have uh, fairly uh, high emissivity. But if you look at the same surface at an angle of 85 degrees, it will have a low emissivity or high reflectivity. Remember that emission and reflection uh, go in the opposite direction. If a body emits a lot, it won't reflect a lot. If a body, uh, I first start with absorption. If a body absorbs a lot, it won't reflect. Okay? Then you have to relate absorbed emissivity. And there's a well known law called Kirchhoff's law, which says that the amount of the emissivity of a surface at a given angle, given wavelength, has to be equal to the absorptivity at the same angle and same wavelength. Okay? And this law is very important to derive emissivity from measurement absorptivity in the laboratory. Okay. Now I'll come to this a little later in the lecture. Okay. Let's continue on what are the satellites used for measuring uh, these properties. There are two main categories. One is uh, a polar orbiting satellite. That is, it uh, path goes through near the poles, not exactly over the poles, but very close to the poles. The other one is geostationary, which uh, rotates along the equatorial plane of the Earth. Okay. The polar orbiting satellite is very useful because it typically covers the entire globe uh, within one, one to two days. Okay. So you get global coverage. So most satellites used in meteorology, oceanography, and uh, remote sensing is uh, our polar orbiting. Okay. And you can adjust the altitude depending on uh, how much, uh, uh, how high resolution you want. And remember that you cannot put the satellite at a very low orbit because of the drag of the atmosphere, it will come down quickly. So typically the satellite altitude is 800 to 1000 kilometers from the surface. If you do that, the satellite will last for five to 10 years. Then it will start coming down, okay? Now the other satellite is geostationary. It is uh, launched uh, to be in the equatorial plane and its altitude is around 36,000 kilometers over the earth. Uh, that is to ensure that the period of this satellite is exactly equal to the Earth rotation period, so that it looks apparently stationary. Okay, it rotates at the same uh, rate as the Earth rotation. So, as far as you're concerned, the satellite is stationary. Okay, so this is very useful because for tracking cyclones and for getting data very regularly, you want the satellite to be stationary. But remember that if you're on the equatorial plane, it won't be useful for Russians or to people living in uh, Antarctic, okay? So for those people, polar orbiting satellite is very important. For those of us in the tropics, geostationary is the most convenient because it gives you data throughout the day and night. But remember that the area that can be covered by geostationary is not global. It is confined to 60 south to 60 north. It can't go beyond that, okay? So, uh, uh, so this again, whatever I said is there in words here for you to look at. And uh, so advantage of satellite at altitude of 418 kilometers in polar orbiting uh, uh, satellite is that it covers the whole Earth and hence it's uh, useful and microwave sensors can only be used in low earth orbiting satellite because microwave signal emission signal from the earth is very very low it's about one millionth of what you get at 10 micron so if you want to sense uh, measure the radiant microwave you cannot uh, be in a geostationary orbit because you won't get the signal because you know the radiation intensity goes down as one over r square okay so uh, so you will not get much radiation at the satellite uh, if your satellite is in geostationary orbit. But it's OK for IR and visible because their radiation is much stronger than in microwave. Although that's the adv advantage of uh, polar orbiting is global coverage and uh, can use microwave. But the problem is that it will not come to the same point. Let's say the satellite goes to Bangalore right now at 3.30 p.m. 
Then it will come again on Bangalore only around 3.30 a.m., only twice a day. So if they want to uh, watch a cloud uh, or a cyclone uh, intensifying, you cannot do that with polar wind satellite, okay? So geostrategy is a must for uh, tracking cyclones, okay? So if you want to use uh, polar bedding, then you need, since each polar wind satellite typically gives you two observation per day, if you want data every hour, that is 24 observations per day, you need 12 polar wind satellites, so it's very expensive. Uh, but that is going on right now. People are launching many, many satellites so that you have more than one satellite available uh, to look at the Earth. Geostationary, of course, there is a wide coverage because it's at a very great height. Uh, but it doesn't cover latitudes above 60 degrees north and south. And, of course, very good uh, coverage in time. You can get data every few minutes. So for satellite tracking is very critical, okay? Uh, and also you can measure the, uh, how things vary uh, day and night, how the clouds appear and disappear between day and night. All that is very useful, okay? Uh, the spatial coverage is only limited to 60 degrees south, south and not suitable for polar region, not suitable for microwave, okay? Now, these are just repeat. I just got this from various websites. Uh, typical resolution visible from GSS around one kilometer. It can go to even 500 meters. Uh, infrared has less, uh, in, less radiation, so in a little more uh, bigger uh, observation area of four kilometers, okay? Now, polar opening satellite, uh, in infrared, you can even get one kilometer because you're closer to the Earth, okay? That's the advantage. Now, remember that you want to use an active sensor, you cannot do it on a, on a geostrate satellite because it is very heavy, it requires a lot of power to launch it to that height. So most of the active sensors are in polar opening satellites, remember that. Now, here is a typical picture of the coverage by Terra satellite of NASA carrying the bodice instrument, about which you'll hear a lot more, I'm sure, from Professor Anil Kulkarni. Uh, so this shows a global coverage, okay? And you see that although the coverage is global, uh, there are some missing between two uh, passes of the satellite, there's a slight gap, okay? Now remember that as the satellite goes around the poles and typically takes 90 minutes approximately, in that 90 minutes, the Earth has rotated, okay? So when it comes next time, it's in a different uh, place of the Earth compared to previous. So like that, it covers the whole day. Even 90 minutes, you'll get 16 uh, snapshots per day. And depending on the how the satellite scans the scene, uh, you can miss some regions. For example, here you can see some areas are missed, little gaps are there. So that you have to be very, very aware of, okay? This is because after this image is obtained, people in NASA and other agencies will smoothen the data and give you a nice picture covering the whole Earth, but some of them are not real data, they are interpolations. So please keep that in mind. Forget, don't always think that whatever you get satellite is the truth, there can be some problem. Here, here is an example uh, from other satellites, there's a large gaps, okay? There are larger gaps depending on how the scanning is done. Here's an example of the, uh, as the uh, scanner, what's called cross-track scanner. A satellite moving in the X direction, in the Y direction, by oscillation, the sensor will move in the Y direction. And uh, depending on the sensor, it's, uh, uh, the size of the pixel can be like the blue one, or the green one, which is smaller. And I don't think you can see there's a red one, which is a dot, at the center, which is very small. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, this has a, uh, what do you call, small pixel, you cannot see it uh, easily, okay? So this is a more modern uh, satellite, AMSUB. So it gives you 16 by 16 kilometer pixel 
which looks like a dot. The older one, MSU A, gives 48 by 48, that is green. And the oldest one is MSU, uh, it is not, it's mentioned here in the top. And that is, of course, very crude. It gives you the blue. Okay. So you must remember that every time you look at satellite data, ask yourself, what is the footprint? How much is the size of the pixel it gets? And uh, so that will uh, determine the application that you can use it for. Now, here's another example of MSU A microwave channel, and it is scanning in this direction. I can see right under the satellite, uh, the pixels are very close. As you move away, there's a slight gap in the data. Okay. By the time the satellite acquires data from one thing to the next, there's a slight gap. Now, keep this in mind. Okay. Now, what uh, NASA and other uh, satellites they do is they interpolate here and give you a nice picture like this. It's the same picture as this. I hope you realize it. This is what they send you, and you are very happy. Okay, but remember that this picture contains a lot of interpolation. So if you're looking for rainfall signature, you've got to be very careful because if it was raining here in this gap, your satellite will not be able to notice it. If it's not raining here and here, but raining in between, satellite will not show you that. It'll show you some smooth. A clear sky. Okay, so must remember always that you must carefully look at the satellite data. What is the pixel size? What is the weight scans? And don't try to interpret the interpolated data, which looks very nice, but a lot of it is fiction. It is not real. Is that clear to all of you? Any questions? Anyone? Are there any questions yes, there in the chat yes, box? Sir. Yeah, yeah, one is there. Yeah. Uh, full form of AMSU A and AMSU B. Uh, AMSU is Advanced Microwave Sounding Unit A, the first one. AMSU B is the second one. That's it. When you have uh, like inside uh, 3A, 3B. So once you start a series, you give them A, B, C, D name. That's all. So these are one of the earliest. Uh, AMSU was the original. Microwave sounding unit launched in 79, and then they improved the uh, centimeter advanced one. So MSU, MSUB were launched uh, later. Okay. Anybody else? So, are there no other questions, right? Uh, actually, sir, one question is there. Uh, how can we fill this yeah. gap? But which gap uh, she has not see, filled? See, filling a gap, you have to be very smart. See, all of you know that the standard practice in mathematics is interpolation. You have two dot at two point, dot at in between, you have to interpolate. For interpolating, you have to know something about that uh, variable you are trying to interpolate. For example, take temperature. Now, suppose you get satellite data of temperature and there's a gap over 100 kilometers. You can interpolate safely distance. On the other hand, if you are trying to uh, uh, recall study clouds, you cannot interpret clouds. If there's a cloud, uh, let's say in Bangalore, and there's a cloud in Tumkur nearby, in between there may be no cloud, right? So cloud cannot be interpolated. So any variable which varies rapidly, like rainfall, cloudiness, and maybe vegetation, you've got to be very, very careful, okay? But things like temperature, uh, no problem. You can interpolate safely. Okay. Now here is an example of the uh, data coverage by geostationary satellites and polar orbiting satellites, and you see a clear difference. The polar orbiting covers the whole globe. Geostationary covers mainly the tropics and a little bit of the mid latitudes. Now here's the comparison between two satellites. Uh, the black one is the polar orbiting satellite. And the red one is the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission launched uh, in 1998, uh, 1997. And it is one of the most important missions to measure rainfall. Since they were interested in measuring primarily tropical rainfall, they restricted the satellite to only go between 35 south and 35 north. Okay. Uh, beyond that, they didn't worry about. And so the satellite was uh, launched at an angle different from 
what you launch for full opening satellites okay and so notice that by doing that you are getting more number of data points in the tropics the number of the coverage of trim over tropics is far higher than coverage by a polar orbiting satellite okay so there's always a trade off between uh, coverage and temporal sampling if you want more temporal sampling then you have to sacrifice on the coverage okay now here is an example of how much uh, data trim gives in one day and two day in one day there are lots of missing points uh, but by second day you covered most of the points okay now i talked about scanning scanning is very important technique in satellite to get large coverage so the the most important example is a cross track scanner nothing but a rotating uh, disk that's all very simple because remember when you put anything on a satellite it has to be simple because you cannot repair it once you launch it it has to work for 10 years or 5 years so they use a simple disk which rotates okay it has a mirror so it scans various parts of the uh, earth as you scan it and when it goes up it will uh, look at the sun or the moon or other sources for calibration purposes so in one 360 degree revolution it will scan the earth in the downward part and scan the sky and sun in the upward part for calibration okay and here is an example of how you can do both nadir scanning and off nadir off nadir means the scanner is slightly at an angle so it has a, a, a conical shape of the sensor i use conical scanning because when you want better reflection then you want to go to higher angle uh for the scanning now the third one is called the uh, push broom uh, thing this is like your all of you now have a camera in your uh, mobile it has the ccd uh, charge coupled device very very powerful device imagine all the sensors are now lined up here in this direction and the satellite moves in the direction so this gives you a complete coverage without scanning okay so but you have more more number of uh, more number of sensors here 10 20 100 sensors and they all move together and give you the rectangular patch at the ground so this is very popular in the visible because these ccd devices are available in the visible region in the infrared you will not get too many of these they are not as good so primarily in the visible this is a technique used because there is no real scanning here so there are no moving parts so more reliable the cross track scanner scanner can fail in spite of all the careful uh, calibration and work done still it can fail so the push room has a linear array of detectors okay in the cross track direction and as the satellite moves it gives you a rectangular patch of uh, data now one of the important issues in remote sensing is image resolution okay so whenever you take satellite data you have to look at what the resolution is what it does so that depends on the application so uh, where the satellite say they have an imager which means they are focusing on high horizontal resolution okay so images are designed such that they give you a high horizontal resolution but if you want vertical profile of temperature or moisture then you have to sacrifice uh, on the horizontal resolution you are more worried about vertical resolution these are called sounders the sounders main job is to get the vertical profile so for doing that they have to sacrifice on the horizontal uh, averaging okay uh, then your resolution depends on how high the satellite is satellite is 80 km above the earth it can give you a fairly good resolution but if you are at 36000 your resolution will become poorer obviously okay and of course there are optical system used we do the focusing they also will determine your uh, image size okay and of course the sensor cost sensor size all those play a role now we are come to the uh, emission uh, transmission uh, absorption transmission of the atmosphere uh, and you can see that this transmission here 
transmission is high only in 0.4 to 0.7 and uh, around microwave. There's a small region around 10 micron with transmission around 0.9, which is not very good, but adequate. And then three to four micron. There are a few places where you get around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, you can accept it. But the best is microwave and visible. Here's another picture showing absorption. So in this window region, absorption is very low, 0.3 to 0.1 micron and uh, 8 to 12, except for the ozone absorption, 8 to 12 is fairly transparent. So another picture showing uh, uh, <coughs> transmission, okay? And uh, here is the microwave. Uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, absorption. In the microwave, there's very little absorption. In the infrared, absorption is very strong due to water vapor. The entire region from about 15 micron to 100 micron, completely opaque, okay? All of you know that the emission by the Earth is maximum, uh, by the sun is maximum around 0.5 micron, but the Earth is around 10 to 11 micron, okay? Now, because of the high frequency photons have more energy, in the visible region, you can uh, get very small pixel size because there's more energy available. You can use a small uh, area averaging. But as you go to 10 micron, you have to slightly compromise uh, because the H nu at 10 micron is much lower than H nu at uh, 0.5 micron, okay? Then you go to microwave, the H nu is even smaller. So you have to use uh, very large averaging. So microwave's main problem is if it is passive sensor, you have to use large area averaging to get some signal, okay? Now, the other thing is how you look at the data. If you look at the data uh, by, data looks vertically down, that is called nadir measurements. It gives you the vertical uh, profile of the atmosphere. But on the other hand, if you look at the, uh, the satellite, look at the sun's radiation coming through the atmosphere horizontally, it's called limb measurement, okay? Now, limb measurement is used when you want to measure concentration of gases whose concentration is very small, like ozone, uh, chlorofluorocarbon. If you try to measure them by vertical scanning, you will not get much signal. Because vertical scanning gives you 10 kilometers of atmosphere. Horizontal scanning can give you average over 200 kilometers of the atmosphere. So limb measurement is mainly used for measuring minor gases. But the penalty pay is you have to average over a large distance horizontally. While nadir measurement gives you very high, very high horizontal resolution, limb measurement won't give you that, okay? Here is an example of carbon monoxide measurement by limb sounding. And you can see that uh, you don't get a lot of uh, uh, structure here. It's averaging over a large, so CO is shown to be large both over India and China a large region uh, measurement where there's a lot of air pollution during uh, most of the year. And that is best measured by limb sounding of a minor gas like carbon monoxide. Now, the other thing is called occultation. Occultation is a word used by astronomers. Suppose you look at the star or the sun through the atmosphere. You can measure the amount of aerosol or amount of ozone the atmosphere, this is your sensor, this is your uh, source of your radiation, star or sun, and here is one measurement outside the atmosphere, one measurement inside the atmosphere, and you can use the difference to calculate. This difference is a measure of how much absorption has occurred. <clears throat> now, in addition to all this today, they are doing what is called formation flying, because you cannot put too many uh, sensors in one satellite because of the problem of weight, power, and volume, you can use many, many satellites in the same equatorial plane, okay, one after another. So here was a very grand mission called the Aqua Train, where they, they plan to launch one, two, three, four, five, six satellites, one after another within a few minutes, so that, uh, for example, CloudSat had a radar, Calypso had a LIDAR, Parasol also had a LIDAR, and so on. So, so you are measuring 
essentially the same cloud or same part of the earth within few minutes of each other okay and it also had a what is called the orbiting carbon observatory but unfortunately this satellite failed so we don't have the data but otherwise all this data collected was supposed to help in retrieving carbon dioxide i'll talk about that a little later now in this aqua train different satellites have different uh, roles cloudsat is an active instrument a radar and its main role is to find the vertical structure of clouds modis mostly has passive sensors so it is that to measure the cloud top temperature okay the advanced microwave uh, spectral radiometer uh, is there to measure rainfall cloud droplets and rainfall okay so three different satellites measuring the same scene within a few minutes of each other okay so in order to uh, estimate various quantities that satellite uh, sensors you need to know the surface property of the earth so a lot of work has been done in the laboratory to measure the uh, reflectivity of various uh, things snow uh, wheat and uh, various uh, other thing of course rocks limestone soil and so on and clear water all these are required for your inversion of radiation intensity to a physical property here example comparing bare soil reflectivity with vegetation vegetation has a lot of spectral uh, resolution because of photosynthesis certain wavelengths they absorb more so uh, so it gives you more structure than a uh, bare soil and clear water of course has very little reflectivity now remember that whenever you measure reflectivity from a satellite you have to worry about both the angle at which satellite measures and the angle at which the sun appears at that time okay suppose you measure reflectivity of ocean and the sun is directly at zenith you will get a low value but if you measure the same reflectivity and the sun is at about 60 degree you get a different value so you have to know what is the angle of the sun and angle of satellite both that's very critical now let's come to how various gases uh, are measured by satellite the standard technique is to measure the absorption in the solar region okay now what you do is you uh, use sun as a source sun radiation go through the ozone layer once and twice coming in going out and you measure what is the intensity coming back after going through that passage twice compare it with what is coming directly to the satellite that ratio is related to how much ozone absorbed from the sunlight okay so you use two wavelengths one wavelength where ozone does not absorb and one wavelength where ozone absorbs and that is necessary because the ground reflectivity will change from various parts of the world so when you take a ratio the reflectivity of the ground it cancels out okay that's the beauty of this method so this is called differential absorption method you measure the difference of absorption between the center of the ozone absorption band and outside the band okay you choose two values nearby one in which the absorption is strong one which there's no absorption so this method is used in lot of examples because very convenient because it go through the uh, atmosphere twice so you get double the signal okay now what are gases measured ozone oxygen water vapor co2 all these are measured by this technique now the most recent satellite for measuring carbon dioxide was this agreement has been signed so very soon the satellite will start measuring how much co2 is released the various power plants and various sources around the world and they will have uh, what do you mean an inventory for each country and each country has to make a promise how much they will release and it will be verified by satellite in five years okay so this is the plan that's a lot of money being spent on measuring carbon dioxide okay now how is it measured uh, you measure both the amount of oxygen uh by oxygen absorption in one uh, wavelength that is visible 
then carbon dioxide in two different wavelengths to improve your signal and uh, take the ratio. So you're going to get the ratio of amount of carbon dioxide, amount of oxygen. Okay. Okay, N2 is not changing, so you can assume the value of N2. Now there are two ways to measure this. One is in the solar region that is shown in, uh, that's what OCO does that is in blue. You can also measure in the infrared by the advanced infrared sounder that's in red. Now notice that the weighting function of the uh, sensing is very close to the ground for OCO and it is around five to six kilometers for airs. Now I'm going to stop here and ask, does anybody know why the weighting function is different for airs and OCO? Anybody can answer it? Put the answer in the chat box, okay? So how do you have a look with anybody has got the answer? Okay, so the answer is that in the case of OCO, we are measuring the absorption of solar radiation. Remember the highest concentration of CO2 is near the ground. When we say CO2 is 400 parts per million, we're talking about rho CO2 by rho air. The rho air is highest at the ground. So highest CO2 is at the ground, so we get the maximum signal at the ground, absorption signal. In the case of as, it is measuring the emission by carbon dioxide, and it will measure mainly the emission around five to 10 kilometer region. And also it depends on temperature. Remember in the case of OCO, temperature plays no role, because it's solar radiation you're talking about. In the case of infrared, uh, region, you're talking about temperature as well as CO2 uh, emissivity. So both play a role combined, both these, the maximum occurs around six kilometers. So this cannot be directly used to calculate the total amount of CO2 because the signal near the ground is very small here, the weighting function, okay? So we should, uh, so the accuracy of as for total CO2 is not as good as OCO, but still it's useful to have it uh, in our thing, okay? But remember, both OCO and AS will not give you data on a cloudy day. On a cloudy day, both of them will fail. You cannot do anything for it. Here is a measurement of OCO for the Northern Hemisphere, uh, showing that although the global mean uh, concentration is around 400 and uh, at the, in 2015 was around 400 parts per uh, million, there are parts of the world which are higher, which are mainly urban and uh, high population density region of the world, okay? Where, are, where there are less people, CO2 is less. In the oceans also, CO2 is less. So this clearly shows that human beings play an important role in the release of CO2, okay? Now look at another example from OCO in China, there is a large increase in concentration. The departure from the global mean. So in China, there are parts where the amount of CO2 is three parts per million more than the global mean. In India, it's around one part per million. This shows China is highly industrialized on the eastern side, and lots of power plants are there, coal power plants. They're emitting a lot of CO2, and you can see that, okay? Now, you can also use the same technique to measure sulfur dioxide, which is a major pollutant, okay? And you can see this measurement made uh, by, uh, I think, uh, I forget the name of the satellite, most probably this is the uh, European satellite. Uh, so this one shows the uh, high SO2 emission around Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, okay? And notice that as this is uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and seven years ago, see how rapidly it's increasing. There are more and more power plants, more and more industries, so SO2 emissions going up, and it is a major uh, air pollutant, and then it becomes sulfate aerosol, and it gives you more difficulty as an aerosol, okay? Now, one of the most important application of satellite is for clouds. So here is an example of uh, cloud top temperature measured by a satellite, uh, and it shows the east-west oriented cloud on, uh, Date is missing here, yeah. 22nd July, 2020. In the middle of the monsoon, there's a nice ITCZ. 
intertropical convergence zone where moist air from the north and the south meet and give you an east-west oriented cloud band, okay? So this is uh, the heart of the monsoon system. And this uh, we can see very nicely with satellite data, both in visible and IR. Now, trim was used to measure rainfall. And uh, it had one radar, which had a nadir look, and it had a, a trim microwave imager, which is a passive sensor, which had a conical scan. It cannot, it cannot go nadir because radar was there, so it went a little bit uh, conical scan. <clears throat> yes? Any question? Uh, Arya, can you mute all the people so that there's no background noise? Now, the trim was so successful that uh, a few years ago, they launched the uh, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, which uh, built on the success of trim. Uh, trim had one uh, frequency radar. Here, there are two radar frequencies to measure both uh, what you may call light rain and heavy rain. Okay. Now, here is the uh, picture artist view of the uh, GPM. Uh, there are two radars here coming down at the same point, and that is a microwave imager which is looking conical scanning. Okay, and uh, so the microwave imager, which is a passive uh, imager, it covers a range from 10 to 180 kilohertz frequencies, while the two frequencies of the radar are 13.6. 35.5. These frequencies are chosen depending on the droplet size. Uh, if the rainfall is heavy, you get droplets around one to two millimeter size droplets, okay? And so you make sure that the wavelength of the radar is corresponding to that uh, size. Then you want to measure drizzle rain, smaller droplet, then you use slightly different frequencies. Uh, uh, so that's the two frequencies are meant for uh, light rainfall and heavy rainfall. Now, that alone won't help because uh, GPM uh, coverage is not that good as trim. So you need a lot more satellites. So they took the help of satellites from all countries, including India. India launched Megatropics. So all the satellites from all the countries were used together with GPM. GPM was called the mother satellite. And these are all uh, daughter satellites. All put together, we got a very good data. Now, here is an example of coverage by GPM alone and trim alone for one day. You can see trim coverage is mainly tropics, 35 south, 35 north. But GPM had a larger coverage, 65 south, 65 north. But look, look at there are more gaps because of that. So always remember, in satellite technology, there is a compromise. If you want more coverage, you have less sampling in some regions. If you want more sampling in time, you have smaller spatial coverage. That is the nature of the uh, satellite technology. Now, there have been two other uh, uh, satellites. Uh, the, these two satellites, TRIM and GPM, you can uh, compare how they are. TRIM covers 35 or 35 now. GPM covers the larger region. GPM has two radars. TRIM has only one radar. Okay. And the high frequency radar for TRIM was for GPM was used to get a smaller wavelength, uh, smaller uh, size droplets measurement. Okay, now here you can see that the two uh, radars, one radar picks up the heavy rain, the tropical rain, and the other radar picks up the rainfall in middle latitudes, Europe, for example. Europe does not get as high heavy rain as we get in India. Uh, that rain also you have to cut correctly. So in a global mission, TRIP was a tropical mission, this is a global mission. They have to get both middle latitude and the tropics correctly. Okay, this is a repeat, I'm sorry. Now, here's an example of the uh, one year's data from GPM showing the rainfall in the Pacific and showing very beautiful intertropical convergence zone uh, that goes all the way from Dateline to the coast of Peru, okay? So this shows that in the Pacific, there is a very steady east-oriented rainfall band, which plays a very important role 
in altering the climate of the whole globe. This is a very important region. Pacific is the largest ocean in the world. It has the most important ITCZ, and that has an impact on global climate, okay? For example, all of you know a phenomenon called El Nino, where this region becomes warmer, so the uh, rainfall here increases, and here it decreases, and that alters the rainfall all over the world because it uh, creates a different uh, outflow, and that outflow uh, comes down in some countries and alters the rainfall. Okay, now microwave is very important. I want to remember that. So this picture is the best way to remember. Here is a man whose image in the visible and in the microwave. In the visible, you cannot see his gun, but in the microwave, the gun is clearly seen. Okay, so microwave penetrates everything almost, except uh, heavy rain. Uh, passive microwave, you can use various frequencies, all the way from 37 to 6 gigahertz. These are the older channel frequencies. But when you go to low frequency, H nu is lower, that is the energy is lower, so you need a larger area of averaging. If you go to higher frequency, you can reduce your area of averaging substantially, okay? So this was uh, uh, the uh, frequency used to measure wind speed over ocean. So if you want high resolution, you have to go to high frequency. Uh, but if you are happy with this resolution, then you can use low frequency channel. Now, when using a microwave, you must be aware that emissivity in the microwave of ocean is not one. For example, typically at 15 gigahertz, emissivity is around 0.4, okay? And slowly decreases, okay? Now here I'm comparing emissivity of ocean with emissivity of ice, huge difference. Ice emissivity is 0.9, ocean is 0.5, okay? So this large difference is very useful to identify sea ice. Sea ice will show a much higher emissivity than ocean, okay? So once satellite came, the microwave sensors came, we could accurately measure the sea ice in the Arctic, which is a very important thing to measure to know the state of global warming. Here is an example of the uh, data, which is uh, from ships from 1870 to 1979. From 79, we have the satellite data. Notice that in the satellite era, the sea ice has dropped dramatically, okay? Huge drop from about 10 million square kilometers to 5 million square kilometers. It has come down by half. So the prediction is the way it is going, in the next 30, 40 years, the sea ice will completely disappear in summer. In winter again, it'll come back, but summer will go completely. And that will have an impact on the albedo of the Earth. Now, here is an example of how emissivity varies with frequency again for wetland, sea water, wet snow, and these will be covered in more detail by Professor Anil Kulkarni when he talks about uh, directing snow and ice, okay? Now, the sensor characteristics are very important uh, when you're designing a satellite. Uh, you, must, you, you choose a sensor according to what resolution you want in the vertical and horizontal, and what kind of sampling you will have, and what wavelength you're going to choose. All that will determine what kind of sensor you want. And remember that, Sensors are very expensive for space application. So uh, whenever we talk about a design of a satellite, cost is a very important factor, okay? That's the last term here. You cannot uh, ignore that term. You, you can get very good sensors, but they're very expensive. So continuously you have to discuss with the uh, policymakers about uh, why we need that sensor, because uh, most of the satellites uh, based on taxpayers' money. So we have to justify everything that we do, okay? And we have to worry about instrument noise because that alters your quality of your signal. Okay, so in satellite remote sensing, what you're measuring is either the direct emission from the surface or emission from the atmosphere or scattering by atmosphere. Uh, so, so these are the various rays that you look for. For each application, some rays, but for example, here, ray one is from the sea surface. That is a useful signal for this application of temperature. Rest are all noise. You have to somehow reduce their effect, okay? But in some other application, to measure temperature atmosphere, ray four is important. Ray four is atmospheric emission, okay? 
So then you don't want all the other rays, you want to eliminate them. So these are just uh, various examples of how the rays come together. Now here's a typical microwave instrument. Look at the size of the antenna. Because microwave signal is very, very weak, you need large antennas to collect the uh, signal, okay? So this is a major problem in satellite uh, technology because this large uh, disk, if you are to carry inside the uh, satellite, you have to fold it because there's only so much volume available to put a satellite. So normally they are folded and they're open or they are placed in some other way. They are placed in a position, then they're opened up and they come out. Now this is just an example of very satellites which have been used over the last 30, 40 years. This is just for your information, I will not. Uh, the satellite to measure ice, uh, the special satellites of various application. Sea level rise was measured by Jason. So this we already covered, uh, GPM. I'm sorry, this is repeat. Uh, this is CloudSat, uh, which used a higher frequency than GPM to get uh, clouds which are not raining non-raining clouds, okay? Like thin cirrus, for example. So this is very important to get the radiation budget of the Earth. So uh, clouds are also measures snowfall uh, pretty accurately, okay? Uh, so clouds are global thermal product, the only real product. Uh, so this is a question people are comparing clouds are with other satellites. Now, of course, satellites have been very useful to uh, identify cyclones. And today, because of microwave, you're able to see the uh, microwave signal from, from, from cyclones, and we're able to get a me better measure of rainfall. Rainfall estimation is now very accurate because of uh, microwave sensors. One is a rainfall product, one is the water, water water vapor product, okay? Uh, notice the water vapor is large over a large region, but rainfall is there only over that ring around the eye of the cyclone, the eye wall. Now, satellites can also be used to measure winds because clouds, when they move, they tell you how the winds are moving. So this is called cloud motion vector. Uh, so these are uh, from different geostatic satellites. So entire world is covered and you're able to measure how the winds are moving. And, but remember that this cloud motion vector will give you winds only at the altitude where the cloud is there. So you cannot get, get uh, the velocity at every height. You can't get that. So to do that, recently the Europeans launched a very ambitious satellite called Aeolus, which is a Greek uh, god for wind. Greek mythology, like uh, we have uh, Maruti in in our uh, mythology, they have the god of wind. And uh, so this was launched. This is an active sensor, okay? It's a laser, which sends out a very uh, strong beam, and it measured the backscattered radiation. And all of you know that if the uh, aerosols or molecules or clouds or rain is moving, then there is a Doppler effect. So the frequency of the uh, laser coming in and scattered back will change because the, uh, the target is moving. And it will only measure the, uh, measure the velocity perpendicular in the direction along the, along the direction, not, not any other direction. Along the direction will tell you what is the velocity, then you have to resolve it into three different directions, okay? Now, this satellite gave us for the first time, let me go back here, this satellite gave us for the first time atmospheric winds even when there are no clouds because molecular backscattering tells you the rate of these molecules are moving. So this is the first time we are able to get wind at all heights and all parts of the world, both cloudy and cloud free. Okay, that's a major achievement, but it gave you data only for one year. Now, to remember that in microwave, uh, frequency is very critical, I've shown you a nice picture of a large antenna and a small antenna, okay? The large antenna is for the uh, low frequency 
uh, microwave, okay? 